Jeff Buckley was one of those artists that suddenly stormed the scene and changed music forever in just about a decade of activity. Justin Hawkins, the singer of the British band The Darkness, describes him as an anatomical anomaly. And if you ask any other great vocalists from the early 2000s, they will surely mention Buckley among their biggest influences. He even inadvertently changed Radiohead's sound forever. His passing through the musical circuit was so disruptive and brief that it would even be fair to compare him with legends like Jimi Hendrix and Kurt Cobain. But what made him so special? Jeff was born in Orange County, California in 1966, the son of Tim Buckley, a musician who had achieved moderate success in the 1960s and early 1970s. He grew up in Southern California, and his childhood was marked by his parents' divorce and his father's death when he was only eight years old. Buckley was a talented musician from a young age. He started playing the guitar when he was just six years old, and by the time he was a teenager, he was performing in local bands. After finishing high school, he attended the Musicians Institute in Hollywood, where he completed a one-year course at age 19. Although in many interviews he mentioned that he felt like that year was the biggest waste of time of his life, he also admitted that learning music theory helped him understand the interesting harmonies from artists such as Ravel, Ellington, and Bartok. In 1990, Buckley moved to New York City to pursue a career in music. He quickly became a fixture in the city's music scene, performing in clubs and building a following. He recorded his first EP, Live at Sin E, in 1993, which showcased his impressive vocal range and guitar skills, which included four tracks, one being Van Morrison's song, The Way Young Lovers Do. Jeff was indeed a master of reinterpreting other artists' work, and this was the first formal release of one of his covers. Buckley's big break came in 1994 when he released his debut album, Grace. The album received critical acclaim and helped to establish Jeff as a rising star in the music industry. Grace featured Buckley's distinctive voice, which ranged from a whisper to a howl, and his unique guitar playing, which combined elements of rock, folk, and jazz. Despite the success of Grace, Buckley struggled with the pressures of fame. He was a sensitive and introspective person who found it difficult to cope with the demands of the music industry. He was also haunted by the legacy of his father, who died of a drug overdose at the age of 28, something that surely shaped his character. In 1996, Buckley began work on his second album, which would be called My Sweetheart the Drunk. The album was unfinished at the time of his death, which came in May of that year. On the evening of May 29th, while on tour and waiting for his band to arrive at Memphis to work on his new material, Jeff decided to take an evening swim in a channel of the River Mississippi. A roadie from his band, Keith Foddy, was with him, but remained on the shore looking over a radio and a guitar they took there. When a tugboat approached the area, Keith decided to move that guitar and radio to protect them from the boat's wake. When he looked over the water again, Jeff, whom he recalls was singing the chorus of Whole Lot of Love from Led Zeppelin just minutes ago, was nowhere to be seen. He was caught in the wake of that same boat and drowned. His body was found days later. Jeff's life was cut short probably at the prime of his career. And it's impossible not to wonder what would have been of music today were he still around. His work was so impactful that its influences still resonate today in the music of many bands, and it surely will for decades to come. One of these bands crossed by Buckley's grace is Radiohead. While Tom York and his bandmates were recording The Bends in London, perhaps one of the better regarded albums from their discography, they ran into problems with one of their songs. The tune was none other than Fake Plastic Trees, and the band just couldn't make it work. Frustrated, after a long session and an even longer week in the studio, Tom and some of his friends decided to take the night out and go see a concert in the city. Jeff Buckley was playing, and as in most of his shows, it was just him and his electric guitar. Dougie Payne, the bassist of the band Travis, and Tom York's friend was there with him, and he recalls that show completely blew their minds. For Mr. York, it was mostly the fragility and emotion Jeff Buckley could share with his songs, effortlessly soaring through every section of his vocal range. After experiencing that, Radiohead returned to the studio. But Tom York wasn't the same man that left it the last time. Fake plastic trees was still the stone in their shoe. But during this session, he finished it in only three takes. He broke up in tears after the last part was done. 
Seeing Jeff Buckley live made him understand the power an ethereal, soft but truthful, and emotional performance can have. Since then, nothing was ever the same. Tom learned to embrace his falsetto, something that up to that point was disregarded in his music. This was the influence of Jeff Buckley, and as he crossed Radiohead's path, he also did with many other bands and lucky souls that had the chance to see him live. And I correct myself. It was not just him and his Telecaster that night. For a moment, and for many there, it was everything. The best way to understand the magic behind such a performer is by breaking down some of his best performances. For many, what he did with Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah is the best showcase of his genius. Hallelujah was originally released in 1984 and had little success. It was not one of Mr. Cohen's instant classics. However, in 1991, John Cale did a cover of the tune which pretty much set the foundations for the hundreds of versions that came after it. Leonard Cohen's original version was more recited than sung, and it was way more about the lyrics than its melody, like many other pieces from the poet. Cale's stripped piano reinterpretation breathed new life into the song and was the one that captivated Jeff Buckley, so much so that he tried his own cover. It was released three years later and was one of the tracks of his debut album. This new version featured Buckley's vocals and guitar playing in a very intimate and fragile setting. Contrasting with the deep, low vocals from Leonard Cohen, this new take on the now-acclaimed song was something else. Jeff had taken the song to another realm, and it was an instant alternative rock anthem. Grace, his opera prima, is a masterpiece of modern music. It is a work of art that touches the soul with its haunting melodies and deeply personal lyrics. Listening to Grace is like taking a journey through Buckley's soul. His voice is raw and emotional, conveying a sense of longing and vulnerability that is both heartbreaking and inspiring. The album's title track, Grace, is a perfect example of this. Buckley's voice soars over the driving rhythm section, while his lyrics paint a picture of someone struggling to find meaning in a world that can often seem chaotic and meaningless. But grace is not just about sadness and despair. There is also a sense of hope and resilience that runs through the album. Songs like Last Goodbye and Lover You Should Have Come Over are filled with yearning and desire, as Buckley sings of the joys and sorrows of love. Throughout Grace, Buckley's voice is both soft and powerful, soft in its vulnerability but powerful in its ability to convey the depth of emotion that lies within him. His lyrics are poetic and introspective, exploring themes of love, loss, and self-discovery. In many ways, Grace is a reflection of the man himself. Buckley was an artist who lived life on his own terms, unafraid to explore his emotions and share them with the world. His tragic death at a young age only adds to the album's sense of poignancy and beauty. Listening to Grace is a reminder of the power of music to touch the soul and connect us to something deeper within ourselves. It is a work of art that will continue to inspire and move people for generations to come, a testament to the enduring legacy of Jeff Buckley and his extraordinary talent. Although Buckley was a very competent guitar player, and his choice of chords and voicings throughout his work is captivating in itself, his unique talent was really singing. Apart from his incredible vocal range, which is not something to dismiss either, his ability to connect it was rarely seen, at least until he became a thing. If you listen to his performances carefully, you will hear how he ebbs and flows through vocal lines effortlessly and without any noticeable shift in his tone. This is an anatomical anomaly, as I mentioned Justin Hawkins cleverly described him as one. It's not normal for people to be able to sing like that, especially without years of proper vocal training. His chest and head voice worked as if it was just one thing, and he sang through his lines as the music required it. Buckley's masterful use of falsetto, which inspired Tom York, was in no way a limitation or an alternative to his head voice, he moved among the two placements and used them just as different colors to paint on a canvas. His one in millions vocal talent was not an isolated thing, however. As I suggested earlier, it was his overall musicality that gave him the legend status. There are many singers out there that can sing with a four-octave range. However, none other has ever influenced as many people in the way Jeff did. To me, Jeff Buckley always has had something in the likes of Nick Drake, another artist I covered on this channel. 
Probably it is because I discovered both at a similar point in my late teenage years, but I think there's a case to be made in how influential they both were for many singer-songwriters we all love nowadays. They also left the world way too earlier than many of us have wished, and although disputed in Drake's case, their departures were accidents, and at similar ages. And despite the fact that it's somehow an egotistic thought, I would really have loved them to be around for longer and had the time to create more music. Jeff Buckley left us with only 13 original songs and about 40 covers, counting those from his live performances, while Nick Drake had time to officially release just 31 original tunes during his active years. The big difference between the two is that while Nick Drake's work remained for decades without a big break in the mainstream, and he wasn't considered an industry-wide influence probably until about 30 years after his passing, Jeff Buckley was already starting to feel the sweet taste of success when it all ended. One can only imagine how many great songs they both left unwritten, but remembering and learning from such geniuses is something anyone interested in music should enjoy. Jeff Buckley was a man who lived and breathed music. He was a true artist, never compromising his vision or his sound for the sake of popularity or commercial success. Buckley was an enigma, a man who left us far too soon, but whose legacy will endure for generations to come. His influence on music cannot be overstated, and his impact can be felt in the work of countless artists who have followed in his footsteps. Jeff Buckley was a force of nature, and his music will continue to inspire and move us for years to come.